Now, I take this opportunity to introduce Professor Alladi Uma, Professor in English, University of Hyderabad. Her specializations are women's writing, Indian literatures, African-American literature, comparative studies, and translation. Now, I request Professor Alladi Uma to speak on the topic gender and translation in the global context. pleasure of working with him and um, I know that uh, there are many occasions when we have differed but we have each respected our differences and it is in this spirit that uh, I'm going to talk here but before I do that I must thank uh, Shugupta for having invited me to give the plenary talk here and also Professor Amina Kishore uh, with whom I've had some interaction over the last year, year and a half and with Maulana Azad uh, National Urdu University. Somehow I do not like the acronym Manu because it has certain other connotation and therefore I'd like to spell it out fully. Uh, <coughs> uh, this morning I was a little surprised um, that we are talking about names and so on and identities that um, the university from which uh, Professor Abzal Khan comes from uh, was named B. Marathwada University. I've just had some people in my own department speaking on the huge debate that went into the renaming of uh, Marathwada University, with the B standing for Baba Sahib uh, Ambedkar. Um, therefore, it, uh, identities are very important, and therefore I'm talking about identities in my um, in my talk. I'm also particularly happy to be here because of uh, Om Prakash and Govinda Govindaya. Uh, who have been our students and who have been in touch with us all through the years. Uh, uh, I've always valued students and I'm very happy to come back where my students are working and I'm happy that they remember me. Um, I, it is in this spirit. Uh, thank you so much. I mean, I, I've always valued Hyderabadi polite culture, and I wish many of us learned this from, uh, from Hyderabad and from the Islamic culture in Hyderabad. Um, uh, <clears throat> my topic, uh, I was wondering when Shugupta sent me the concept note as to what I should speak on, because this was a uh, seminar on new directions in comparative literature. There are no, trend, no new trends in translations, says Sudhakar. We have to have our old trends, and our old trends have to be worked upon, he says. Um, maybe I'm slightly different. Um, I need to talk about my own views. And uh, so I thought, how do I combine my interests in gender and my interest in translation and uh, talk about something which will be meaningful to an audience here? Uh, which comes from varied places, and therefore I thought I would talk about gender and translation in the global context. This morning, I was there, unfortunately, I wasn't there for Shugupta's concept note and uh, Professor Amenek Kushore's uh, introductory remarks. I was there when the, um, <coughs> Ms. Catherine uh, spoke, and also when the Vice Chancellor spoke, and of course, uh, Professor Afzal Khan's talk. Uh, <coughs> Uh, Ms. Catherine did speak about uh, the, the movement away from the melting pot to the salad bowl culture of African America, uh, of America and therefore various voices that, that exist in this multicultural context called America. And also there was also a reference that India is also a multicultural land. Uh, um, my paper attempts to look at these two lands and to see whether this multiculturalism is actually a reality or what kind of multiculturalism exists. So I will go ahead and I have a prepared paper, so bear with me, I will read from my paper. I <clears throat> I'm sorry I didn't send the paper in advance for you to have the copies. I've been interested in the questions of gender for a very long time. My initial research was on African American women writers and I tried to place them alongside Indian women writers of English. Sub subsequently, my exposure to Dalit studies and Dalit women writers made me rethink of the comparison I had attempted earlier. I realized that though some sociologists believe that race and caste are incompatible, there were ways in which we could bring the African-American and Dalit women together. For a comparison, 
is not only viewing of similarities, but a willingness to accept differences too. <clears throat> My resolve was strengthened when I saw the dialogue between two significant thinkers, W.E.B. Du Bois and B.R. Ambedkar. All of us are aware of the Durban conference where there was a vociferous call for the acceptance of caste in the same manner as race as an international issue. We are also aware of the more recent decision of the United Nations to accord the same status. Unfortunately, India has not, did not agree to this kind of a thing. In this conference on comparative literature, I therefore chose to focus on gender and translation. Gender, the reasons for it, I have already explained. But why translation? Much of my understanding, I won't be wrong in saying most of our understanding or misunderstanding if we are to accept that translations are not very good of Dalit writing comes to us through translation. Two Dalit writers I refer to here, Ambedkar and Meena Kandasamy write in English, but many of the other voices come to us through their English translation. I'm aware of the politics of translation. I'm aware of the debates on who chooses the text, who teaches them, and why. I'm also aware of the questions raised regarding teaching African American or Aboriginal or Native American literatures alongside Dalit literature. I will deal with these objections in a, a little while later. The 1970s has been referred to as the second renaissance of the African American literature, the decade of women writers. African American women's voices, especially of the 19th century, were quote unquote unearthed during that time period to tell us that the writers writing in the 1970s had indeed a tradition of their own. <clears throat> Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye becomes a significant text in this context. 40 years later, does this text still speak to us in the manner it did then? I attempt to use my own location as a woman, an Indian, a researcher in the area of African American literature, and a teacher to negotiate questions this text raises in today's scenario where there is a push towards a global understanding. I know here there may be some who object to the word Indian. I, I, I do understand that the word Indian is not a homogenized entity, and as an Indian, I do know all the heterogeneity that goes along with that. So I hope that that particular objection will not be raised as I go along with the thing. I was a student of American literature in India. <clears throat> I had read the classics of America. These, I felt, helped me define America in many ways. A new nation, a nation that believed in the self, a nation that was asserting its identity, a nation that believed in the tenets of democracy, a nation that believed in the never say die way of thinking, a literature that it asserted itself, its identity, breaking away its umbilical cord with England. Hemingway was the prime example of all that America stood for. His work, The Old Man in the Sea, San Diego, his clear blue eyes, his indefatigable spirit, the iceberg writing style with its unsept depths, these were what contributed to our understanding of America and American literature. <clears throat> Many years later, exposed to feminist debates, exposed to other voices and varied ways of reading texts, and conscious of my own position as a post-colonial woman, I could not naively accept Hemingway or Santiago as the quote-unquote quintessential American or the old man in the sea as the quintessential American text. One crucial text that challenged Hemingway's position as the quintessential American was Toni Morrison, The Bluest Eye. My real interaction with African-American writing and with African-American women's writing was in the late 1970s as a graduate student in an American university. The writings by women touched such a chord in me that my doctoral dissertation emerged from it. It was a comparative study of Indian women novelists writing in English and African-American women novelists, a study that attempted to locate the women in both cultures and draw out similarities and differences. 
I didn't know of comparative literature then. I didn't know of uh, field called comparative literature. I, I, was, I was doing comparative literature, which I do consciously now. I was then doing comparative literature in a certain sense. It is no wonder that one of the first texts that I read was Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye in an African-American literature course. 1970s was a significant decade for the women writers. 1970 was the year that saw the publication of three significant works, The Bluest Eye of Toni Morrison, The Life of Grange Copeland by Alice Walker, and The Black Woman, an anthology by Toni Kate. The year could be coincidence, could be a coincidence, but the fact that many African-American women were articulating at this time cannot be just a coincidence. The 60s in America was a very politically volatile period. The women's movement, the civil rights movement, the black militant movement, the gray, gay rights movement. In such a scenario, what else can we expect except articulation? It is what the old woman in Toni Morrison's Nobel Prize acceptance speech in 1993 does. Breaks the prison house of silence. Breaks the shackles of years of suppression and humiliation and speaks. I quote from her speech. The old woman's silence is so long. The young people have trouble holding their laughter. Finally, she speaks and her voice is soft but stern. I don't know, she says. I don't know whether the bird you're holding is dead or alive, but what I do know is that it is in your hands. It is in your hands. But she does not. She keeps her secret, her good opinion of herself, her gnomic pronouncement, her art without commitment. She keeps her distance, enforces it, and retreats into the singularity of isolation in sophisticated, privileged space. Nothing. No word follows her declaration of transfer. That silence is deep, deeper than the meaning available in the words she has spoken. Of course, I had no recourse to Toni Morrison's speech from 1978 to 1983 when I had attempted to read and understand her works. But I knew then, as I know now, that she was breaking the silence imposed on her. I knew then that hers was not an isolated voice. There are the two examples I have given earlier. But those were not the only voices I'm thinking of. Hers was a voice that had a tradition, which had traditionally striven to break silences. How could one forget the voice of a Phyllis Wheatley who sang of freedom, a freedom to articulate around the year 1772? I now quote a poem of hers, and you'd bear with me, because these are some poems that most people are not very aware of, and therefore I shall read that, because these are also not poems that are normally anthologized of Phyllis Wheatley. What gets normally anthologized of Phyllis Wheatley are poems which talk about her Puritan self, not about those that question the very establishment in which she is living. To the, <coughs> I must say a small aside here, I don't know how many of you know about this uh, writer Phyllis Wheatley. Uh, she, was one of, she was the first person to have published an anthology of poetry in uh, African-American woman. She was 19 when she published this anthology. And when she published this anthology, she wanted to publish this. And very interestingly, they did not believe that a black slave could have written a work like this. So she was called into a room full of, which is, you know, full of men, white men who are sitting across the table asking questions. I'm sure many of us who have attended interviews at an earlier age or now, or students who go for interviews for their MPhil and PhD programs know what it is to face a huge number of people. And here was a slave girl facing, and she had to prove that she had written the work, you know, that her master did not write it for her. She had to prove this. And it's, it's an amazing feat that she has. And here is the poem that she writes. To the right honorable William, Earl of Dartmouth, his Majesty's Principal Secretary of the State for North America. And I write, Hail, happy days when smiling like the morn, fair freedom rose, New England to adorn. The northern clime beneath her genial reign, Dartmouth congratulates thy blissful sway. Elate with hope, her race no longer moans. Each soul expands, each grateful bosom burns, while in thine hand with pleasure we behold the silken brains and freedom's charms unfold. 
Long lost to realms beneath the northern skies, she shines supreme while hated faction dies. Soon as appeared the goddess long desired, sick at view, she languished and expired. Thus from the splendors of the morning light, the owl in sadness seeks the caves of night. The owl in sadness seeks the caves of night. No more America in mournful strain of wrongs and grievance undressed complain. No longer shalt thou dread the iron chain which wanton tyranny with lawless hand has made and with it meant to enslave the land. Should you, my lord, while you peruse my song, wonder from whence my love of freedom sprung, when, whence flow these wishes for the common good, by feelings hearts alone best expressed, I young in life by seeming cruel fate was snatched from Africa's fancied happy seed. What pangs excruciating must molest, what sorrows labor in my parents' breast. Steeled was that soul and by no misery moved that from a father seized his babe beloved. That such, such my case, and can I then but pray others may never feel tyrannic sway? For favors past, great sir, our thanks are due, and thee we ask thy favors to renew, since in thy power as in thy will before, to soothe the griefs which thou didst once deplore. May heavenly grace the sacred sanction give to all thy works and thou forever live, not only on the wings of fleeting fame, thou, though praise immortal crowns the patriot's name, but to conduct to heaven's refulgent fane, May fiery courses sweep thy ethereal plain and bear thee upwards to the blessed abode where, like the prophet, thou shalt find thy God. When we read this relatively lesser known, lesser anthologized poem of Fieldless Wheatley, alongside the Declaration of Independence, a pertinent section of which I append below, we wonder whether the freedom, the identity, etc., that Phyllis Wheatley is seeking as a black woman will be a reality. He has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring in the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. I have read through the declaration many times. The only specific reference is to the merciless Indian savages. There is no specific reference to the slaves. Are we then to understand that though the fathers of the declaration were willing to accede to the existence of the Native Americans, albeit as merciless Indian savages, they were not even willing to concede the existence of the slaves? Or did they think that these slaves were already citizens of America on 4th July 19, on 1776? But history indicates the contrary, as is evident from the Civil War, the Civil Rights Movement, etc. Is this the invisibility Ralph Ellison was alluding to in his book published about 150 years after Phyllis Wheatley wrote the poem? The book was published in 1952. Women did articulate. How can we miss out the voices of a Harriet Wilson or a Harriet Jacobs or a Frances Harper? Can we turn a deaf ear to a voice from the South by a black woman of the South, Anna Julia Cooper? Many women's voices of the 19th century were made easily available through the Schomburg series, Henry Louis Gates Jr. <coughs> being its series editor beginning 1988. Alice Walker had already paid her debt to Zora Neale Hurston as her, as also the literary mother of many African-American women writers. Does it mean then that these writers, this literature are a product of a moment do they become less meaningful to us now that America has seen an African-American become its president? Even if we were to grant that silences have been broken in the very fact of America having an African-American as its president, how does one negotiate the many discussions that took place regarding his ethnic background, his place of birth, etc.? I remember the speech he made at the 100th year celebration of NAACP and tried to see its relevance in the American context. I quote here parts of his speech. All of us know the speech that he gave as when he took over as the president of America, where he does talk about how much America has moved, though he does talk about the poverty 
of the blacks and the others. But this speech is remarkable in a different sense because he's addressing NAACP, the National Advancement Association for the Advancement of Color People. He's much more frank here. And if you have a chance, it's available on the, on the, on the net. You can go to it and you can either read it or you can even listen to his speech. Because of them, I stand here tonight on the shoulders of giants. And I'm here to say thank you to those pioneers and thank you to the NAACP applause. And yet, even as we celebrate the remarkable achievement of the past 100 years, even as we inherit extraordinary progress that cannot be denied, this is not Uma speaking, this is the president of America, an African-American president of America speaking, okay? Even as we marvel at the courage and determination of so many plain folk, we know that too many barriers still remain. The first thing we need to know is to make real the words of the NAACP charter and eradicate prejudice, bigotry, discrimination among citizens of the United States. I understand there may be a temptation among some to think that discrimination is no longer a problem in 2009. And I believe that overall, there may be less discrimination in America today. But make no mistake, the pain of discrimination is still felt in America. By African-American women paid less for doing the same work as colleagues of a different color and a different gender. By Latinos made to feel unwelcome in our own country. By Muslim Americans viewed with suspicion simply because they kneel down to pray to their God by our gay brothers and sisters, still taunted, still attacked, still denied their rights. On the 45th anniversary of Civil Rights Act, discrimination cannot stand, not on account of color or gender, how you worship or who you love, etc. This goes on, and over half of all African-American students are dropping out of school in some places. There are overcrowded classrooms, crumbling schools, corridors of shame in America, filled with poor children, not just black children, brown and white children as well. This is the President of America speaking to the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, a public speech given in 2009, not too long ago, right? Who is Specola in Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye? A black child, a poor black child, what kind of treatment does she get? What does she aspire for? The text written in 1970 is said three decades before the date of publication. Wasn't that text as pertinent to the 70s as to the time period when it was situated? We have moved another four decades. Has it become less pertinent now? If the narrative structure disrupts our notion of the acceptable even today, are we to deny its specificity and give credit to its universality? A term that may seem to be accepted in today's globalized world. I cannot help but quote two poems, one by Gwendolyn Brooks written in 1960s, The Pool Players, and the other by a Dalit woman writer, Meena Kandasamy, We Real Hot, written in the first decade of the 21st century. While Meena Kandasamy herself has anxieties about validating or teaching Dalit literature via black literature, she cannot but respond to Gwendolyn Brooks's poem, which begins, We Real Cool. Here is Brooks's poem, We Real Cool, the pool players seven at the golden shovel. We real cool, we left school, we lurk late, we strike straight, we sing sin, we drink gin, we jazz June, we die soon. And here is Meena Kandasamy's poem, a poem that comes out of her inspiration of Gwendolyn Brooks's poem, We Real Hot. In fact, it says, the poem's title says, We Real Hot. Underneath it, it says, inspired by We Real Cool by Gwendolyn Brooks. And the poem goes, we real hot, we never rot. We no knack, we beat back. We shock stars, we win wars. We never late, we fuck fate. Look at how Meena Kandasamy uses the poem and then turns it around to suit her own purpose. Each poet, and therefore each poem, has to be understood in the context in which it is written. The turbulent 60s in America inspired Brooks to address questions regarding her race and the stereotyping of her people. It shows her own unique way of responding to these issues in such a cryptic manner. Meena Kandasamy 
uses the same cryptic style and changing the cool to hot and showing outward images of anger and retaliation, not the anger or retaliation is not present in Brooks, strikes out at the casteist society of India. Her location as a Dalit woman cannot be missed. Her awareness of other literatures, other writers, especially women writers who are placed in similar circumstances, 